actually really need an introduction to Tony. He's been a central part of our institution for a long time. Uh, he's a training and supervising analyst here and a clinical professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Um, my experience of Tony is that his papers have been among the most influential, certainly in our institution, but I think really around the country, um, as I read them as a candidate. So uh, I don't want to spend too much more time. I just want to thank him and welcome Tony. Nice to see all of you. <clears throat> I guess we'll need this in this huge place. <clears throat> Morning as a psychological principle. The invitation to give this lecture, the first here in Wilson Chapel, was tendered to me last spring because I gave the first of the more than 20 lectures in this series eight years ago. You will recognize this selection at once as an action in anticipation of expected loss. That is, as a part of a process of mourning that loss requires. It aims at continuity, which successful mourning facilitates in response to the interruption posed by loss. Without addressing the sense of loss in our move to this new venue, I shall attempt to promote continuity in another way, through an elaboration of the process of mourning. So let me pause to thank uh, the committee. And uh, it's, we had a wonderful meeting last week. Uh, so, and I have seen the discussions. And I'd like to get to them faster than I'm going to be able to, because you're going to enjoy them. Uh, bear with me. Uh, but I am sensible of the honor. And so to work. Convention links mourning with the loss created by death. Yet it is a commonplace of everyone's awareness that all manner of losses over a lifetime require mourning. For that reason, our subject this evening is not death and the response to it, but one form of tension inherent in life between the wish to maintain continuity as though no loss had taken place and the wish to live within present reality. The task of mourning is to permit the acknowledgement of loss in such a way as to allow life to proceed normally without the sorts of compromises that we regard as psychopathology. It must take into account the conflict between the need for continuity and the need to accommodate to the reality of loss. Mourning and melancholia. <clears throat> uh, this view of mourning that I've just given you as a process of resolution of a kind of conflict that leads to acknowledgement of loss, places a different emphasis on mourning from the view that Freud expressed in Mourning and Melancholia nearly 100 years ago. At a time when he was focused on libido, but opening the door to a new understanding of object relationships, he put it this way. In what now does the work which mourning performs consist? I do not think there is anything far-fetched in presenting it in the following way. Reality testing has shown that the loved object no longer exists and it proceeds to demand that all libido shall be withdrawn from its attachments to that object. All libido shall be withdrawn from its attachments to that object. It is a matter of general observation that people never willingly abandon a libidinal position, not even indeed when a substitute is already beckoning to them. This opposition can be so intense that a turning away from reality takes place and a clinging to the object through the medium of a hallucinatory wishful psychosis. <clears throat> 
Normally, respect for reality gains the day. Nevertheless, its orders cannot be obeyed at once. They are carried out bit by bit at great expense of time and cathectic energy. And in the meantime, the existence of the lost object is psychically prolonged. Each single one of the memories and expectations in which the libido is bound to the object is brought up and hypercathected, and detachment of the libido is accomplished in respect of it. <clears throat> Why this compromise by which the command of reality is carried out piecemeal should be so extraordinarily painful is not at, easy, at all easy to explain in terms of economics. In terms of economics. It is remarkable that this painful unpleasure is taken as a matter of course by us. The fact is, however, that when the work of mourning is completed, the ego becomes free and uninhibited again. Uninhibited again. That's the end of the quotation. Uh, Freud's account of the demands of reality, that all libido shall be withdrawn from its attachments to the lost object, in which all psychoanalysts followed him for at least 50 years, seems incorrect to me. <clears throat> we plainly maintain our love for lost loved ones. His explanation reflects the view of those whose mourning is impaired, for whom mourning means the expectation of creating loss. They may acknowledge death, but their psychic reality holds on to the illusion of permanence and continuity. For example, one of my patients at the outset of treatment said he had to have analysis, implying a need but also a reluctance. He had sought analysis earlier, but it had been entirely unsatisfactory, ending with him in a way taking care of his depressed analyst. That disappointing conclusion, however, was not the reason for his reluctance. It turned out that he imagined that analysis through mourning would lead him to lose what little he had of his father, who had died when the patient was 12. Mourning, in my experience, far from creating loss, makes it possible to remember the lost loved one without the barrier produced by an anxiety that loss may occur imminently. I do not believe that withdrawal of libido or the correlated idea that the ego contains only a limited supply of libido is the best way to gain a grasp of mourning. What is difficult to explain in terms of economics is easier to understand with the concept of psychic reality. In my view, what makes mourning so painful is that it requires the acknowledgement of loss. Emphasis on acknowledgement. Overcoming a wish to deny the loss, to keep things seeming to be as they were. That is, mourning requires one to relinquish an illusion of unaltered continuity. But the surrender of that illusion, however painful, does not create loss. It is a necessary response to loss that has occurred. Is that all clear? Good. Good. We're on our way. Mourning and identification. Let us pause here to take note of Freud's great achievement in mourning and melancholia. The recognition that mourning opened the path to new forms of relating to the lost object through internalization. That is by identification, which as you well know led to a whole new territory of formulation and observation in the structural hypotheses of 1923 in the ego and the id. It may be that this identification is the sole condition, he says, under which the id can give up its objects. At any rate, the process, especially in the early phases of development, is a freak, very frequent one, and it makes it possible to suppose that the character of the ego 
is a precipitate of abandoned object cathexes and that it contains the history of those object choices. So you can see Freud has now taken mourning into the realm of everyday losses from the beginning of life. The depressive position. Among the many advances that followed Freud's stark structural hypothesis and the subsequent shift in his theory of anxiety, the work of Melanie Klein expanded on some de developmental implications of Freud's ideas on mourning. For her, the depressive position, a concept which some thought to be her greatest contribution, comes about with the increasing recognition, acknowledgement of the infant's separateness from mother and with the recognition of whole objects rather than part objects. I realize I'm bringing coals to Newcastle for most of you, but I, I am trying to spell out the thoughts. So if you bear with me, we'll get somewhere. Uh, <clears throat> It thereby becomes the defining achievement that makes mourning possible, the depressive position. Although I do not find the theory of the earlier paranoid schizoid position as useful as do some, with its emphasis on the role of the death instinct and the danger of attack on the internalized good object, the broader idea of successive developmental positions has great merit. It is a structural concept, as Hannah Siegel pointed out, that implies movement in both directions between positions. I share the view of John Steiner, however, that, and I quote him, it is confusing that the word depression has been applied both to the state that accompanies mourning and to that which results from the defenses mounted against mourning. The path that leads towards facing the loss and mourning it is associated with painful depressive feeling involving guilt, regret, remorse, and a wish to make reparation. These feelings were thought by Klein to represent the depressive position and are very different from those observed in depressive illness. Although mixed states are common, severe depressive illness or melancholia results from the defenses against loss and hence against all those feelings associated with the depressive position. The clinically depressed patient is likely to suffer anxiety and persecution, to harbor grievance and to deploy manic and obsessional defenses that aid in denying the reality of the loss. <clears throat> Excuse me. Steiner came to a conclusion very similar to mine when he wrote of Freud's description of mourning. Quote, if successful, this process leads to an acknowledgement of the loss and a consequent enrichment of the mourner. When I approached this problem from the viewpoint of free association some 30 years ago, it seemed to me that the painful recall of myriad small memories leads one to regain a portion of oneself that has been lost on account of its intimate connection with the object of one's affection. Again, the challenge that reality poses to the illusion of permanence and continuity leads to a state of anxiety over expected loss and defensively shuts off connection with a portion of oneself which creates a real loss. Mourning releases the mourner to regain that portion and through internalization to produce a permanent identification. The form of mourning. The form of mourning as described by Freud was highlighted by Edith Jacobson. Describing a recently widowed woman, she wrote, I could easily observe how she would talk for some time about her past happy life with her husband. Then turning to the painful period of his illness and death, she burst into tears, only to go back to her wonderful memories and return to the tragic events and her painful current situation with an, another eruption of grief. 
This vacillating attitude seems to be characteristic of the processes underlying states of sadness and grief. Apparently, the painful experience of loss leads to an inner dichotomy. It is not by chance that Jacobson's description starts with wonderful memories and ends with sad ones. Mourning for a lost loved one is bittersweet. The happy memories which create the illusion of closeness inevitably become painful exactly at the point of greatest closeness. No doubt that is what Freud was getting at with his idea of hypercathexis and withdrawal of cathexis. Here I want to emphasize the alternation between the two sides of the dichotomy, the vacillating attitude to which Jacobson referred. For me, the inner dichotomy is a divergent conflict and the alternation between the two sides is characteristic of the pattern or resolution of such conflicts. In this way, mourning becomes the prototype of divergent conflicts. Oh yes, you have to put up with that again. <laughs> Not very long. Convergent and divergent conflicts. A brief review may help to clarify the two types of conflict. Psychoanalytic theory is replete with divergences, beginning with bisexuality and emphasized in instincts and their vicissitudes. But none of these is described as a form of conflict. One crucial component of the theory, repression, was originally described as having a convergent component and a divergent one. Freud called these the push component of repression by the censor from above and the pull component from below. That is from all that has already been repressed. The latter was in fact Freud's contribution to the concept of repression. For the push component of repression had entered psychology in 1830 and had become the basis of Wilhelm Griesinger's influential ego concept in his mid-19th century textbook of psychiatry. For him, the ego was a group of ideas that pushed other ideas out. That was, his, <coughs> was actually uh, uh, Herbart who, did it, who described this idea in 1830. And until 1915, Freud repeated this view of repression many times. For example, it is a mistake to emphasize only the repulsion which operates from the direction of the conscious upon what is to be repressed. Quite as important is the attraction exercised by what was primarily repressed upon everything which it can with which it can establish a connection. Probably the trend towards repression would fail in its purpose if these two forces did not cooperate if there were not something previously repressed, ready to receive what is repelled by the conscious. That's the end of the quotation of 1915. With the introductory lectures in 1916 and 17, Freud appears to have relegated the pull component to fixation and used the term repression to signify only the push component, the effect of the censorship the anti -cathexis. Employing this terminology, he wrote, quote, a perfect model of an affective fixation to something that is past is provided by mourning, which actually involves the most complete alienation from the present and the future. But even the judgment of a layman will distinguish sharply between mourning and ne neurosis. There are, on the other hand, neuroses which may be described as a pathological form of mourning. End of the quote. Here Freud uses the term to describe the state of being in mourning. He emphasizes the mourner's rejection of reality in favor of holding on to the illusion of continuity. So it is remarkable that in 1920, as he was trying to revise his theories, he wrote so uncharacteristically in order to make it easier to understand this compulsion to repeat, which emerges during the psychoanalytic treatment of neurotics, we must above all get rid of the mistaken notion 
that what we are dealing with in our struggle against resistances is resistance on the part of the unconscious, end quote. He corrected this error five years later in inhibition, symptoms, and anxiety in the small part of that book that one can understand, the appendix, <laughs> the addenda. And he introduced five types of resistances. He says, it must be that after the ego resistance has been removed, the power of the compulsion to repeat, the attraction exerted by the unconscious prototypes upon the repressed instinctual process has still to be overcome. There is nothing to be said against describing this factor as the resistance of the unconscious. A few lines later, in accord with his new terminology, this became the resistance of the id. By, quote, the attraction exerted by the unconscious prototypes upon the repressed instinctual process, Freud was reverting to his old divergent concept of the pull component of repression. That is, of the element in the dream that tends to move upwards and is pulled down. That's divergent. <coughs> The term conflict, however, still referred only to push components in psychoanalysis. Although two of the five newly designated resistances, the resistance of the id and the resistance due to secondary gain, were described in pull terms rather than in push terms. Furthermore, as my great friend Edward Weinschel noted nearly 60 years later, before I had spelled out my ideas, quote, it is very difficult, perhaps impossible, to formulate meaningful interpretations dealing with such phenomena as the repetition compulsion, the adhesiveness of the libido, or the channelization of various instinctual discharge patterns. We try as best we can to point out repetitive patterns and repetitive dynamic configurations. We have much to learn here. Although the divergent conflict, that's the end of the quote, although the divergent conflicts had been restored to theory they had not been restored to an understanding of psychoanalytic process. Melanie Klein's depressive position created a place for one aspect of the tension of object loss, but in a different language. So the connection to conflict theory and its implications for analytic intervention was not clarified. The two kinds of conflict, convergent and divergent, differ first in form then in their characteristic affect, and finally in the pattern of resolution and the kind of insight obtained. In convergent conflicts, two forces meet head on like two football teams at the line of scrimmage. It's like this. In the divergent conflicts, the forces pull apart as in a tug of war. Patients sometimes literally say they feel torn apart. Jacobson's description of the vacillating attitude in mourning represents one prototype for me. In convergent conflicts, the characteristic affect is anxiety, where in divergent conflicts, the affect is the threat of loss, often with a sense of either or. The pattern of resolution of convergent conflicts is the familiar heightening of tension, diminution of defense, and clear well-defined new awareness, whether the recall of something forgotten or the recognition of an avoided affect. Divergent conflicts are resolved by going back and forth between the wishes that are pulling in opposite directions, like the tide coming in, until the individual no longer feels the form of pain in recalling the lost loved one, or the tension between opposing wishes has gradually disappeared. No sharp endpoint is recognized. Patients often say, I just don't feel that way anymore. Well, the worst is over. Ambivalence. <clears throat> <laughs> I want to return to the second important feature of melancholia that Freud emphasized in Mourning and Melancholia, the connection between ambivalence and self-criticism. Let me take one more of those. For the lights. <clears throat> the intense self-reproaches 
of melancholia, he argued, could be understood as an attack on the internalized object as well as a punishment for ambivalence. Freud's formulations extended the recognition derived from his study of narcissism of an internal critical agency, a grade in the ego, later the superego. To this self-critical agency, he attributed the self-reproaches. In a creative review of Mourning and Melancholia, Thomas Ogden pointed out a decade ago that Freud thought that for such a dynamic to obtain, the ambivalence had to have preceded the loss. Here's what Ogden says. What differentiates the melancholic from the mourner is the fact that the melancholic all along has been able to engage only in narcissistic forms of object relatedness. The narcissistic nature of the melancholic's personality renders him incapable of maintaining a firm connection with the painful reality of the irrevocable loss of the object that is necessary for mourning. Very likely, that's the end of the quote, very likely other influences in addition to narcissistic disorders diminish the tolerance of conflict and thereby prevent resolution of the interaction between ambivalence and mourning and lead to depressive states. Several authors have also noted the improbable absence of ambivalence in Freud's description of normal mourning. Ambivalence, which is ubiquitous in human relationships, is only less intense in normal mourning than in depression. For Freud, conflict was always convergent and its resolution was always through the lifting of repression and the auxiliary defenses. Conflicts between the many divergent elements recognized in psychoanalysis, such as heterosexual and homosexual wishes, masculine and feminine identifications, love and hate, active and passive tendencies, progression and regression, independence and dependence, were never thought of as different in form from the ones in which one pushed the other out of consciousness. This was true also for ambivalence, a term he borrowed from Bloiler, which came to mean in psychoanalysis exclusively love and hate directed to the same person. Usually, with the aid of reaction formation, love would be understood to push hate out of conscious awareness. Ambivalence had originally signified a divergence in Bloiler's description of schizophrenic patients. And in its early uses in psychoanalysis, that was also true. Adhering to Bloiler's use of the term and many instances in the psychoanalytic literature, I originally referred to divergent conflicts as conflicts of ambivalence. It took me a long time to recognize that even those conflicts that Freud described as intrasystemic within the ego were seen as convergent and not, as they seemed to me, divergent. Eventually, I settled for a change of names and included ambivalence among the divergent conflicts. Since the divergent conflict that loss creates between the wish to perpetuate the past condition and the need to acknowledge the loss requires a process of mourning rather than the lifting of repression, explanation, explanations of how mourning works have not tallied well with conflict theory. How does self-criticism for hate of a loved one prevent the completion of mourning that we see in depression? I believe it does so by interrupting the required alternation of the wishes in divergent conflict. Forbidding, forbidding expression of hateful thoughts and then of loving ones too. The relationship between self-criticism and the wishes it forbids is a convergent conflict. That is, the criticism attempts to keep the hate out of consciousness. It is worth noting here that the interaction between the two types of conflict is the usual state of affairs. It is rare to see either alone. Can get a pretty good picture of either alone in some adolescents and in toddlers in the uh, rapprochement phase. But, but you don't really see it all alone. 
The power of ambivalence was illustrated to me again when I was asked to see a 22-year-old man in consultation some time ago. Following his junior year in college, he had taken an attractive, prestigious summer job in another city. Becoming increasingly upset, wanting to jump off a bridge, he decided to return home and was admitted to a psychiatric ward. In an interview with me, three points became clear. First, he was overwhelmingly anxious, barely able to tolerate the interview. Second, he did not know how to deal with his divorced parents, who were at extreme odds with each other. He was angry at both and loved both, but the combination perplexed him. Third, he wanted to kill himself to get rid of the intolerable anxiety and pain that he could not escape. He did not express a sense of worthlessness. The antidepressant medications he had been given were of no help, he said. Diagnostically, it appeared that he suffered from psychotic anxiety, not from a depressive disorder. It seemed that the anticipation of loss of one or both parents, owing to his anger, had led to it. Three days of antipsychotic medication were sufficient to return him to a normal affect. He readily grasped that he could find a way to live with both love and anger. And with the help of his treaters on the ward, he arranged a meeting with both parents who had not been together in the same room for four years. Fully aware of his own need for further help and treatment, he explained to the staff that they would have to go slow in the meeting because it would be difficult for his parents. <clears throat> in regard to ambivalence, the model of convergent conflict only, the idea that one feeling pushes the other out of consciousness, is insufficient. I believe the young man in question was torn apart between ambivalent feelings and by a feeling that he had to choose between his parents another divergent conflict. Once the anxiety had been allayed, he was able to use the help offered to him to find his way toward a constructive solution. The ambivalences were not resolved, but the helplessness created by anticipation of loss was vastly diminished. Trying to understand the pain of mourning and inhibition symptoms and anxiety in 1926, Freud wrote in another addendum, pain is thus the actual reaction to loss of object, while anxiety is the reaction to the danger which that loss entails and by a further displacement, a reaction to the danger of the loss of object itself. The psychotically anxious young man I described a few minutes ago faced a threat of loss owing to his ambivalence, which caused the extreme anxiety that he sought to obliterate by suicide. One can say correctly, however, that he also sought help to keep from suicide. Reduction of anxiety permitted attention to the ambivalences with the help he was given. Ogden is right, I believe, in noting that, I quote, in Mourning and Melancholia, Freud uses the term ambivalence in a strikingly different way. He uses it to refer to a struggle between the wish to live with the living and the wish to be at one with the dead. Neither Freud nor Ogden chose to see ambivalence as an example of a different kind of conflict. For me, it is divergent conflict. I believe that seeing ambivalence this way makes it a great deal easier to understand how unconscious self-criticism for unconscious hate towards a lost object interrupts the mourning process. As I said earlier, unconscious self-criticism prevents the alternating expression of the two ambivalent wishes. Here's another example. A 14-year-old boy was referred by his mother some six months after the death of his much-loved and admired father. He was pretty clearly the most secure of her three highly intelligent children. I had referred both of his older siblings for treatment earlier. But he was falling asleep in school and in general had not recovered his native liveliness. A gloomy dream represented the state of affairs. He was lying down in a snowbank 
possibly some sort of tunnel. Associations did not seem to come readily, so I suggested that he draw the dream image. To his amazement, he drew a picture that we both recognized at once as Piglet. With an immediate connection to the lament about the snow and nobody knowing how cold his toes were growing. Tiddly palm. Warm memories of Winnie the Pooh and being read to in childhood reflected the other side of his ambivalence, which we recognized. This was a step along the way to recovery of a sudden memory of a moment a few months before his father died. His father was in the hospital receiving a final diagnosis of untreatable cancer. As was their wont, my patient read his current book report to his father over the phone. And as he read, Lord Jim's triumph is in death. He had felt he was saying that his own triumph was in his father's death. The painful, self-critical reaction to this thought kept him at some emotional distance from his father in the remaining months and prevented the necessary mourning after his father died. Relief followed recollection quickly. In this case, it was not a matter of lifelong ambivalence preceding a depressive reaction. Here, I believe, the upsurge of Oedipal wishes in early adolescence overwhelmed his ordinary balance and led to the self-interpretation of hostility and death wishes and punitive unconscious self-criticism. You can find a similar uh, dream image uh, in Freud's uh, uh, two uh, formulations on two principles of uh, mental functioning. Progression and regression. Another crucial form of divergent conflict is the one between progression and regression. Some 50 years ago, Anna Freud revised our view of regression by describing it as a principle of normal development, not merely as pathology. Regression in mental development, unlike in somatic development, requires backward motion as well as forward motion, regression and progression. She did not describe it as developmental conflict, although in regard to regression in drive development, she noted the long-standing psychoanalytic association between regression and fixation. In my view, Anna Freud's description of regression and progression in normal development bears a semblance to the process of mourning. Hence, I have referred to it as a process akin to mourning. Both have appeared to me to be the prototypes of divergent conflicts. Trauma and mourning. This brings me to another topic, the relationship between mourning and trauma. It is clear enough that trauma acts as a fixation point to which the traumatized individual must return again and again without relief. By trauma, I mean the consequences of a noxious influence that breaks through the ordinary means of warding off painful or frightening events. Trauma may come from an external source or from the person's body and occasionally from the person's mind as when the prospect of repetition of a painful mental state or illness becomes a source of continuing anxiety. In every example I have seen, trauma produces punitive self-critical attitudes, both conscious and unconscious. Edward B. Brink's theory of depression as a reaction to helplessness seems to me to arrive at the same conclusion. Guilt as a response to trauma appears to occur very early in childhood, according to many observers. Why this should be so remains an unsettled matter, I believe. The interference by self-critical attitudes prevents the resolution through mourning of the conflict between the fixation created by trauma and the wish to live in the present and move on into the future. 
a focus on the self-critical tendency first, rather than attempts to promote recollection of the trauma directly, is apt to be helpful in the promotion of mourning. Mourning and termination of analysis, and we will soon come to the termination of the paper. The place of mourning in the process of psychoanalysis does not require further amplification here. Mourning and remembering have been central to psychoanalysis from the first. One aspect, however, may be worth reconsidering here, the process of termination. Again, mourning at the end of a long, intense relationship holds no particular surprise. Some 20 years ago, however, I tried to show that for some men whose early experience with their anxious, depressed mothers had required greater than usual dependence on their fathers, it was correspondingly harder to develop the necessary independence from me to engage in a competitive Oedipal relationship. Somewhere the punctuation in that sentence got lost, so I'm going to say it once more. I tried to show that for some men whose early experience with their anxious, depressed mothers had required greater than usual dependence on fathers, there was a corresponding difficulty in developing necessary independence from me to engage in competitive and edible relationships. I described the arduous process of helping these patients with the interaction between self-critical attitudes to their competitive and hostile wishes and their fears of losing father and of losing me. These fears also impeded the conclusion of the analytic work. The unsatisfactory measure used by Freud in the forced termination of the analysis of the Wolfman seemed to me to accept the patient's pathological belief that mourning is impossible because the mourner believes it creates the loss it seeks to make tolerable. I chose another course by pointing out to these patients that they did not include termination of analysis in their thinking. That is, by interpreting the reluctance to consider termination, I helped them initiate the very slow process of mourning required to resolve the stalemate. The initial reaction to my making this kind of intervention is not always one of warm appreciation. Often the first response is to dismiss me summarily, a threat to stop the analysis at once. A more subtle version appeared in the analysis of man who was very familiar with the analytic literature. But we haven't gotten to my Oedipus complex, he complained. <laughs> and we never will, I replied, unless you include termination in your thinking. To some extent, we were successful. Conclusion. You will by now have understood that my aim here is to focus on mourning or a process akin to mourning as the process of resolution of all divergent conflicts and to persuade you that the ubiquity of those conflicts warrants regarding it as a principle of mental functioning. When I speak of the ubiquity of divergent conflicts, I have in mind that every day, starting very early in life, we must confront some degree of loss in our ties to the past. And once we are past youth in the steady deterioration of our bodies, including our minds. From another angle, choices must be made all the time. And these require tolerance of relinquishing one side to gain the other. We have to accommodate to the demands of reality, to acknowledge that we cannot be in two places at once or have everything we want. But we do not need to pretend that we accept the dictates of reality gladly. Without mourning, the accumulation of painful losses would become unbearable. In that sense, mourning provides continuing, necessary reorganization for the mind. Mourning heals. Welcome, everybody. I want to thank the Academic Lecture Committee for an opportunity to discuss Tony's uh, paper. Tony's paper, Mourning as a Psychological Principle, deals primarily with losses that one experiences as a result of living life and making choices.
Fundamental to all of this is the capacity we have to learn and grow, to imagine possibilities and have expectations for ourselves in the future, even as we presently hold on to a coherent identity of ourselves in the world. New possibilities are exciting, but often there's only a vague recognition of the ambivalence and pain about changing and about acknowledging the loss one undergoes when one is changing. In Tony's words, the task of mourning is to permit the acknowledgement of loss in such a way as to allow life to proceed normally. It must take into account the conflict between the need for continuity and the need to accommodate to the reality of loss. Tony further elaborates the process of change as a divergent conflict and speaks to how it's experienced and resolved. The tension of a tug of war between ambivalently held choices demands a back and forth exploration of each side. Tony refers to this as a process akin to mourning, which when completed allows a recognition of changes in oneself. One doesn't feel the same as one did in the beginning. He recognizes that choices require tolerance and relinquishing one side to gain the other, and mourning provides a continuing necessary reorganization for the mind. In freeing up aspects of self that are tied up in mourning, one is freer to live one's life. I will make two major points about Tony's paper. First, Tony's description of divergent conflict seems to me reflective of an overview of what mourning involves. I find that when sitting with patients, there's more occurring at an experience near level. The phrase process akin to mourning is a generalized statement that must eventually allow for the very unique way that each individual will be involved with the working through of the loss at hand. I'll speak about what I think happens in normal mourning. In reading for this discussion, I found Hans Lowald's developmental theory of the ego useful. In his model, the ego oscillates between a fused state with the internalized other and a differentiated state. As the ego has experiences and works through them, it differentiates. As the ego differentiates inwardly, it constructs reality externally. When the ego develops more complexity, reality also becomes more complex. This back and forth, inner and outer flow, becomes an ongoing developing and synthesizing of differentiating ego functioning and representations that we refer to as identifications. I'll use my own understanding of the process of change that has been informed by Lowall and I'll also refer to the self instead of the ego. Working with patients, I routinely see their internalized experience reflects more than conflict about choices. With each choice, different aspects of a coherent self or aspects not coherently held are vying for expression and wanting different things. These different aspects are reflective of internalized relationships with important others. Sometimes they're consciously known, and sometimes they're unconsciously lived or not fully known. As these internalized aspects of self become better understood in treatment, one holds a greater awareness of the complexity of oneself and the choices one is making. I also appreciate that something of tug of war conflict comes up because there's a certain kind of internal capacity that is being negotiated. The new self function is developing in the backdrop of an older organization. The instability of moving into the new capacity and the resistance of moving from the old one requires progression and regression until a new self-identification is stably established. The new self-identification incorporates the new capacity as well as a more complex and differentiated self in relationship with a greater differentiated world. I believe divergent conflicts start 
as an either-or dilemma and develop into a dialectical tension as successful mourning takes place. At first, the individual moves back and forth from one position to another. Eventually, there's a third position that develops that holds the prior two positions simultaneously, but in a new way that can be reflected upon from a more complex vantage point. While the facts about each respective position might remain the same, the way that the individual relates to the values of the two positions shows growing awareness and emotional responsiveness to each. This helps the individual become more aware of the pain and cost of the change that each choice requires. Development is full of choices and one often retains both positions. And the process of the tug of war itself also contributes to differentiating and enlarging the self into the new identification. I think it's from this new identification that a patient might say, I don't feel the same as I did in the beginning. And what was painful from one level of organization feels very differently at another. Here's an example. A few months ago, I found myself lost and confused after sitting with patients. I was writing progression reports and reading for this discussion and felt my mind opening to new layers of experience with patients. It was exciting. And I could see that my endeavors were allowing me to think more like an analyst and the work with patients was enriched. But afterwards, I felt disquieted by a feeling that I was not my therapist self in my own skin. Here I was accomplishing my desired goals, and yet I felt a, felt a loss of a certain way of knowing myself. This was a divergent conflict. I had envisioned mastering a new set of skills. I thought it would happen in the future, not registering that it was happening now. It was me that was working hard, and I could see things developing in my work. I needed to reevaluate the old notions of my therapist self in light of my analyst self. At first, in the back and forth, I was only aware of the therapist or the analyst, but then I became aware of both and could feel into and reflect on the two positions simultaneously. I had to mourn a certain kind of simplicity that I valued and an idealization of an old sense of mastery as a therapist. I hadn't lost my old skills or my therapist self, but I had to open to what I was becoming at a new level of organization. Both therapist and analyst are present within me, and where I place myself now in relationship to the two positions has changed. I imagine that this will happen from time to time in my development, and sometimes it will hit more of an important chord than others. My second point addresses what happens when mourning is problematic. Tony notes that, patient, that a patient's fear of creating loss rather than acknowledging loss is interruptive of mourning. I find that for patients who struggle with stalled mourning, the resistance to mourning reflects an unconscious need to maintain the established earlier level of organization. With a strong attachment to an early, difficult, caretaking relationship, the patient is unconsciously organized around painful feelings and memories that are self-coherent, coherent, even as the same feelings and memories are consciously disagreeable to some part of them. Changing one's identifications, even faulty ones, creates great loss. These traumatic experiences are held in a dissociated manner and are often pre-verbal or non-verbal. This leads them to be experienced passively because they're removed from internal and external influences. The work in treatment, then, is not simply to name the conflicts, wishes, and defenses, but to help the patient see them as aspects of their unconscious dynamics that have to be eventually owned. The change of passive relating to one's dynamics to an active relating is gradual and is reflective of building consciousness which develops a greater internal capacity and integration of self. 
Tony's paper has asked us to recognize the fundamental nature of mourning in our growth and development. He identifies divergent conflicts as invaluable intrapsychic data that allow us to appreciate where our patients are in the important developmental task of being themselves and what interrupts that process. And to facilitate mourning allows for mourning to heal. Thank you. Really is a very special evening for our whole community and really an honor for me to have the opportunity to participate. I know so many people have worked so hard to bring us together and it's really a wonderful feeling uh, to be in the room. I want to thank uh, Richard, Kim, Lucinda, and of course Tony. It's been a real pleasure, pleasure working together. And I do want to make a pitch as the co-chair with Ellen Pinsky of the BIPSI Program Committee. And I want to extend a special welcome to our first year candidates and to all the psychotherapy fellows that are here uh, this evening. And I want to spend, uh, extend a special welcome for you to come to our Wednesday evening programs, our Saturday programs. In fact, there's a program with Rosemary Balsam this Saturday, not this Saturday, Saturday the 29th, which should be very interesting about the Oedipal complex in contemporary psychoanalysis today. So. Um, the way I think about it, uh, in terms of the first year people, you're not just welcome, but you're really an integral part of how I see it, what psychoanalysis is all about. Uh, I see psychoanalysis really as a living system, and it needs to grow in order to survive. And it really thrives in our consulting rooms, but um, it also thrives here when we come together to build on our tradition of ideas. Your curiosity, your observations bring energy and clarity to this collective task that we have of further developing our analytic knowledge and our therapeutic capacities. Psychoanalytic theories are a rich panoply. They're brilliant, but collectively often confusing and con contradictory. Recent developments have moved to de deconstruct the grand theories of old in favor of more clinically focused, experienced near set of ideas. And to my mind, this has been a very good trend, which has brought forth a lot of creativity and vitality. However, the resulting challenge for all of us, but especially for the new student to these ideas, is how to integrate this rich stew in order to guide and inform our work with patients. What are the crucial ingredients? Is it object relations? Is it modern ego psychology? Is it neoclinian? Is it relational? Is it self-psychology? The whole, the list goes on and on. So what do we do with our stew? One clinician's theoretical meat is another clinician's potatoes, or maybe even celery. The next clinician might think, good, this theory is good for the stock, but I wouldn't serve it to the guests, you know? But each of us must fashion our own recipe and figure out the ingredients that can work together. Can we find coherence in this rich stew? Well, I think Tony has done a wonderful job in his paper tonight, bringing together his theoretical vision and its clinical application in a very clear and well-delineated recipe, if you will. Um, these are ideas that he's been developing in his writings and lectures and seminars and supervisions, as people have said, over the past four decades, and they really permeate the work of many of us here at BIPSI. Tony carefully shows how divergent conflict was contained, but then lost in Freud's metapsychology, and he contrasts and he links convergent and divergent conflicts. He conceptualizes mourning as a divergent conflict and that resolving divergent conflicts involves mourning rather than the lifting of repression and making the unconscious conscious. Self-criticism, which includes shame and guilt, can impede the resolution of such conflicts. I think Tony elegantly and in a moving way captures the key components of his theme and I heartily agree with him. Mourning for Tony is not just a response to the loss of a loved one, but part of a process of coming to terms with all types of loss and disappointment. And this, I feel, is really at the core of our work with patients. Tony describes that mourning is about acknowledging loss rather than giving up the lost object. The result of mourning is a freer emotional connection to what has been lost, enriching the mourner. A block in mourning defensively shuts off a connection to the part of the self. So as I see it, that's the core for me of Tony's message, and I found it quite moving and convincing. Frequently, patients come to us with some form of difficulty in mourning, and there's a large subset of patients who've had childhoods marked by not good enough 
caretaking. In my view, these patients often have difficulty separating, as Lucinda spoke about, separating from these frustrating and hurtful objects, whether it's in life or in death. For my discussion, I'd like to show how I would integrate some of Tony's ideas on mourning into part, into part of an approach to these cases. Not the approach, but an approach to these cases. An approach I sketch out, uh, influenced by self-psychology to a degree. Of course, I don't propose this to be comprehensive by any means. So thinking about these patients who face parental failings that can range from mild to severe forms of abuse or neglect. Some such caretakers can use the child for their own narcissistic needs. Early developmental needs linked to crucial developmental capacities can be traumatically frustrated. Under these circumstances, children learn that emotions are to be feared, controlled, or avoided instead of being the source of initiative and organization. Patients develop defenses and character traits to manage these needs and their painful objects, defenses that prove useful in childhood, but often impede emotional growth and satisfaction in adulthood. These unmet needs must be identified and engaged with in treatment. This is rarely a straightforward process, as we know. Defenses may obscure the needs, as well as entangle the therapist's efforts. Needs may emerge in an archaic form, threatening both patient and therapist. Here, the therapist can use the concept of divergent conflicts. There will be a conflict between acknowledging the need and disavowing the needs. There will be a conflict between the hope that these needs will be met in therapy and the acceptance of the limitation of treatment. Tony said the solution to resolving divergent conflict is a process, and I agree. Ideally, patient and therapist can hold on to two ends of the divergent conflict, to go back and forth as we've been speaking about, to deepen the feelings, to explore the needs, and to mourn lost opportunities for satisfaction, or to review the painful losses as a result of trauma. The goal, much as in mourning for a loved one, is for the patient to be able to relate to the need with greater comfort, to overcome the necessity to carry it anxiously or to completely disavow it. The goal, as I see it, is for the patient to reclaim the need, if we can talk this way, from its painful connection with the bad object and make it available as a guide again, as a source of vitality in the present. And I realize I use the generic term need to reflect the fact that a child's emotional and development needs vary over time through, the, through development. The good enough parent responds to the child appropriately in each phase, resulting in the child's capacity to manage affect and to safely connect with drives and ambitions. An empathic environment keeps in mind the mind of the developing child. Then perhaps mourning can proceed, deepening his capacity to feel some degree of satisfaction with me. Perhaps then he can restore his capacity to sustain his desire for getting more from other people and to put that to use in all aspects of his life, in love, and in work. Time will tell if he can tolerate the closeness and commitment that he yearns for.